Okay, here we go. Spin, ding, ding, and a one, a two, a one, two. With the world turning its attention to treatment solutions and even potential COVID-19 cures, Stony Brook University has been enrolling patients in a convalescent plasma trial and conducting more than 180 dedicated research projects across all disciplines, all with the aim of winning the long-term coronavirus battle. I'm Michael Bernstein, interim president of Stony Brook University. It's May 27, 2020, and in today's Beyond the Expected podcast, Coming Back Safe and Strong, Pursuing a Cure, I will ask three Stony Brook guests about how our researchers have stepped up and responded with the research they're doing on, on the latest thinking about antibodies and what they can and cannot tell us about this dreaded disease. I will ask our guests also what exactly we all need to do to try to stay COVID free over the long term. Let me introduce our guests. Dr. Elliot Bennett Guerrero is medical director for perioperative quality and patient safety for Stony Brook Medicine. He's also professor and vice chair for clinical research in the Department of Anesthesiology in Stony Brook University's Renaissance School of Medicine. Dr. Bennett Guerrero has been involved in many research projects, running the gamut from the safety and effectiveness of blood transfusion to surgical site infection, post-operative morbidity, and cancer recurrence. Most recently, he launched a clinical trial of donated post-convalescent plasma in up to 500 COVID-19 patients, and he's also conducting antibody testing with 500 healthcare workers. We will talk about these significant studies and what they mean today and over the long term as we search for a COVID cure. Dr. Bettina Fries is Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Stony Brook Medicine. She's nationally recognized as a physician scientist in the field of microbiology. She's a professor of medicine and of microbiology and immunology at the Renaissance School. She is also an attending at the Northport Veterans Affairs Medical Center and a fellow of the Infectious Disease Society as well as of the American Academy of Microbiology. A primary focus of Dr. Fries' research has been on the development of antibodies against multidrug resistance bacteria. During this pandemic, Dr. Fries has consulted on COVID-19 infected patients and chairs the clinical trial task force that reports to the Stony Brook University Hospital Incident Command System. We'll get to hear her professional and personal perspective on COVID's effect on society and what we can all do to try to stay as safe as possible. In addition to his role as Vice President for Research, Dr. Richard Reeder also serves as Associate Vice President for Brookhaven National Laboratory Affairs, acting as Stony Brook's liaison to the nearby Department of Energy Laboratory, co-managed by the university with the Battelle Memorial Institute. He is also a member of the Brookhaven Science Associates Board of Directors, and he retains appointment as Professor of Geochemistry in the Department of Geosciences, of which he served as Department Chair from 2008 to 2013. Today, Dr. Reeder will tell us about new research projects at Stony Brook covering various dim disciplines, all focused on COVID-19. I want to thank all of you for being with us here today. Thank you for sharing your time and your insights, and I'd like to start with Rich Reader. Um, just to give a framework to our uh, more focused conversation, Rich, maybe you could give us a sense of the scope of the research enterprise overall at Stony Brook. Michael, it's a pleasure to be here and join my colleagues here. So as you know, Stony Brook is an R1 research university, and we're also a member of the prestigious uh, Association of American Universities. So research is really an important part of our mission. And in fact, it's one of the things that attracts a lot of the world-leading faculty that come here to join our ranks. So we have research programs that cover a number of different areas in sciences, engineering, math, and of course, medicine. And we have uh, a very strong funding base to support that work. Our research expenditures for the last year were exceeding $260 million. Uh, more than half of that is in the School of Medicine conducting research. So, uh, that, you know, it's a very impressive uh, uh, portfolio and it does speak, as you say, to Stony Brook's uh, leading position as a research university in the United States. 
Um, Stony Brook inver- investigators are currently working on more than 180, 80, 180 COVID-related projects. Could you help put that in context for our listeners, and in particular, since you're our senior research officer? I mean, have you ever seen anything like this response to the COVID-19 crisis by our faculty researchers? It's truly remarkable. If you look at the funding that we have now, there are slightly more than 2,000 funded research projects at Stony Brook. We have perhaps as many as four or 500 unfunded projects also going on. So when you look at the research projects that have been created around COVID, 180, it's really quite impressive to see these focusing on a particular topic. It's even more impressive to recognize that they've really started over a short period of just a couple months. Uh, And it's also important to know that of these 180 projects, more than 50 of them are clinical studies where we're actually engaging uh, patients. Well, we're going we're gonna to drill in on the question of these clinical studies uh, in a moment. Um, maybe you could also give our viewers and listeners a sense of the, the challenges of seeing to it that our scientists can safely accomplish their work in, in the challenging environment in which we find ourselves. How have laboratory shutdowns affected labs? First of all, labs not involved in COVID research, and how are you ramping up in labs that are involved with COVID research in a safe and planful way. So I'd first point out that it's been a very disruptive time for research, not just in the medical and healthcare area, but for all different kinds of research at the university. Uh, In mid-March, we gave guidance that essentially required investigators to put their labs in a stand-down mode. The exceptions, of course, were those who were doing research directly involved in COVID-19. Those were allowed to continue, but very importantly, they did so having the appropriate safeguards in place. And we all know what many of those safeguards are, including the social distancing, proper use of PPE, and, and other things to minimize the transmission. And you, I know, have been working with a a fairly large team in putting together a very systematic plan to bring back the research activities in laboratories over time as hopefully the metrics with respect to morbidity and mortality here in Suffolk County continue to improve. Obviously, we're following orders by the from the state of New York, but you at ground level are really seeing to it that we can respond as conditions improve. Maybe give uh, our listeners and viewers a little sense of that work. That's right, Michael. We put together a, a task force of scientists uh, and healthcare providers to make sure that we could restart our research when it was appropriate to do so. And of course, we are taking guidance from both leadership here at Stony Brook as well as uh, health authorities. So one of the important things is to make sure that when we do return to research that it's done in a phased manner so that we don't overwhelm the system that we have here to bring back a small group of researchers initially, learn how they are adapting to the new environment, and then move on to additional phases to bring in uh, additional researchers. And it will be a, a process that we have to monitor very carefully and make sure that we maintain the appropriate safeguards. Thanks, Rich. We'll be circling back to you in a few minutes. Let's uh, turn to our other guests, get a sense of some of the work they're doing directly um, in the COVID-19 arena. Um, Bettina Fries, let's start with you first. Um, maybe you can uh, help our audience understand your role within this uh, hospital incident command system I mentioned when I introduced you, introduced us. Um, this uh, HICS hospital incident command system revved up at the start of the COVID-19 outbreak here, in, here at Stony Brook. So the HICS um, hospital command uh, incidents uh, system is a administrative structure that is put in place whenever you, a hospital has to deal with an emergency and um, there are lots of different positions in that um, command structure and they all try to address different issues that arise during an emergency like supply chain issues redeployment of um, nurses and physicians and um, within that um, hospital command structure I basically um, 
reported to the medical branch and reported on clinical trials that we were trying to um, become part of because we were dealing with a pathogen that had never uh, been a pathogen to humans before and there were no um, FDA approved um, treatment options so we needed to basically stay on top of the literature that was evolving during this uh, um, pandemic and try to get our hands on investigational drugs and try to um, start our own um, uh, um, clinical trials. Right. And this is an interesting point you've just made. You've, you have dedicated your entire career to exploring and uh, fighting infectious diseases, and yet suddenly this, this virus uh, appears that you and your colleagues have had no experience with before. I mean, um, what do you find most unique and challenging about this, uh, about this virus? And of course, in your, in your universe of, uh, of colleagues, what are you all communicating about this, uh, this new pathogen? I guess the most unique thing, um, aspect about this pathogen is that um, it does not only as a pathogen um, causes a problem, but it also causes a problem by eliciting a um, sort of damage-promoting immune response. So it's basically two things. You have a pathogen, and then you have a host that responds to the pathogen. And in many ways, the host makes it worse. So the patient actually makes an immune response that um, makes... Um, makes the situation worse. And that aspect in infectious disease has been thoroughly investigated in the last 10 to 20 years. And that's the most um, interesting aspect about this um, pathogen. And it's, a, it's like too much of a good thing, right? The, the right. body's responding, but it's making, making matters worse. Um, maybe you can help, uh, help uh, our listeners and viewers, uh, you know, let's separate some fact from fiction. How exactly is the virus transmitted? Uh, what should we be paying attention to in that regard? Well, the virus is transmitted from person to person, and um, that means that um, all of this, um, all of these, um, uh, these recommendations to keep apart from each other. Um, that's what this is based on. So basically, you stand close to a person that speaks very loud and spits. That puts you at danger. You're close to a person that coughs. You're close to a person that blows their nose all the time and then shakes your hand without washing their hand. That's how the virus is spread. The virus is in these secretions in droplets, and these droplets basically can be passed um, by um, by handshakes and that's why we try to encourage people to wear masks wherever they cannot keep a safe distance from other people and we also try to promote social distancing so to discourage um, um, large crowds discourage big meetings and that's what the CDC has recommended and that's basically has been the main approach to try to flatten this curve. And, and of course, we have this added complication that there are people who are asymptomatic, right? They exhibit, they seem to be perfectly healthy, but they're expelling these droplets that uh, can infect others. Is that right? Yes, that's true. So we have asymptomatic people and we have so-called super spreaders. So we have some people that have an exceptionally high viral load in their secretions. So they um, basically pose a risk to us because it's been known even from previous um, infections with similar viruses that there are certain patients that end up infecting many, many people, many more than others. And do we know what accounts for some people being so-called super spreaders and others not? Probably they um, are not able to clear the virus as well, and maybe their immune response um, is different, and that's why they basically accumulate these very high viral loads in their secretions. So we've heard a lot uh, in the press about uh, tracing, so-called contact tracing. So maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit about what contact tracing is, how and when is it performed, uh, how is it useful? So contact tracing is basically an aggressive measure to break the chain of infection. So basically what you do is as soon as you have a patient who presents with symptoms, who is diagnosed with COVID-19, you try to find out in, uh, who was in close contact with this patient in, um, in the past couple of days. And so you will then um, trace down all these contacts mm -hmm. and um, 
tell these patients that they have been exposed to a infectious person and that they should self-quarantine. And if you do this in a very efficient way, if you do this in, in a fast manner, then you can really prevent um, this virus to spread um, through the community. But the trick is it has to be done right away. You have a very um, um, short window where you can act. And then the people also have to basically listen. So you have to have a process of implementing this self-quarantine. You cannot just see this as a recommendation, but this is actually then um, more than just a guideline. It's almost an order to stay home for 14 days. Yes, it would appear in some nations where there's been a lot of success in this regard, there is the force of law, usually fines or similar practices that really uh, compel people to pay attention. Um, we hear a lot about 14 days, right? If you discover that you've been exposed or uh, you've been tested and you're found to have the virus, you know, you're told to quarantine for, uh, for 14 days and, and, and isolate uh, for 14 symptom-free days, as they say. So what's the magic about this number? Why 14? Uh, why not some other uh, span of time? Well, 14 days because the median time um, um, that it takes until the majority of patients uh, actually become sick is five days. And that ranges, so that's the so-called incubation time, and that ranges anywhere between two days and 14 days. So 14 days is really a safe margin. We know that by far the majority, almost everybody, will present with symptoms, will become sick um, within 14 days. And those that stay asymptomatic would still become PCR positive. So if you then test these patients and they test negative, then you can be very confident that they actually did not become infected. Thank you. Um, well, I'll be returning I'll be returning to you, Dr. Fries. Let me uh, bring in Dr. Bennett Guerrero. Um, let's start uh, with your specific interest in COVID-19 antibody testing. Uh, maybe you can help our uh, viewers and listeners understand why that's an important part of testing now and why we hear so much about it in the press. Sure. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I think uh, initially there was a lot of focus on the nasal swab testings, the PCR testing that Dr. Fries uh, uh, talked about, which is actually detecting for active virus um, that we may carry in our bodies. But then um, if that virus is cleared over a week or two or, or, or several more weeks, um, we need additional tests to determine whether people have been exposed to the virus. And so that's where antibody testing comes in, where we know that most people who are exposed to a, a pathogen, it could be a bacteria or a virus, will uh, make antibodies. Um, those antibodies initially uh, are uh, generated by certain immune cells within several days, although um, it can take up to several weeks. We've seen some patients with COVID who don't make any antibodies for about two weeks after mm -hmm. infection starts, and then you see a rapid increase in the antibody levels. And then we've also seen some people who don't make any antibodies at all, uh, which is quite scary. Fortunately, it appears to be uh, 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 fairly rare, but it is something that is of concern to us. Um, so, you know, just to emphasize again for our audience, Testing positive for antibodies, uh, what exactly does that mean for someone? Should they be happy and throw caution to the wind? Does it mean nothing? Should they get tested again? What does it mean? Sure. So I think that the main role for antibody testing is on a population health, public health um, perspective. So if you know that, for example, 80% of people in the United States have been exposed to the virus and have already had the infection, that that would potentially get us close to having herd immunity. On the other hand, if only a few percentage of uh, patients have been exposed and been infected, then we know that there's still a lot of people at risk, which is obviously very concerning. So right. I think the main role for antibodies is on the kind of the population health. But for an individual person, I think um, it can potentially be useful, for example, if you were sick uh, a month ago and you're not sure whether you had COVID, you probably aren't going to have any virus any longer in your system. If you show in an antibody test that you have very high antibody levels, I think that would probably be reassuring to many people that they had COVID, uh, that they survived it, thank God, and that now they're recovered. Uh, we wouldn't know that they're uh, 
you know, protected, that's still an open question. I think that most experts believe that people that who do make- That was my next question, yes. Yeah, what that, is that, does it mean you're protected? Yeah, I think, I think most experts believe that it's likely that it, people who have high antibody levels are, gener, are probably protected, but it's still an open question. You know, those are quite difficult studies to do in the sense that you need to follow thousands of people over many months to basically prove that people who have antibodies um, can't get reinfected or they can't get sick again from COVID versus, say, people who don't have any antibodies uh, being at risk. So I think that that is something that um, can be reassuring to people. Um, I think um, knowing that you have uh, no antibodies uh, doesn't really mean that much. Um, it means you probably were not um, infected yet. Um, as we know that most people who are infected do make antibodies. On the other hand, uh, we need to emphasize that um, an antibody test tells you nothing about whether you're actively infectious, about whether you uh, have virus in your body right now that could be uh, uh, something that shed. could be a risk, shed right, and a right. risk to others. Right. That, that's, a, that's a separate test. That's the so-called PCR test you've been referring to you have to do? That's correct. And that's a very, very sensitive test that's looking for RNA um, in the body. And we know that that can actually persist for many, many weeks after mm -hmm. somebody's been infected, although we don't know when you have a very, very tiny amount of it in your body, whether that means that you're still um, actively uh, kind of infected and at risk for giving the virus to other people. To, to someone else. Um, you, you use this phrase, herd immunity. Maybe you could uh, explain that a little further for the for the audience, because that that's that appears a lot in uh, in public discussion these days. Sure, I'm not an expert on it, but I mean the general concept is that once you get up to a certain high percentage of people in the population who have been exposed and are immune, um, I think people use uh, the numbers around 70 to 90 percent. Um, then so many people are um, immune that it becomes much much harder for the virus to spread. Um, around the community. Because if you think about it, if nobody has the virus, then that means that each person that you are in contact with can be someone you infect and then they can infect other people. Right. On right. the other hand, if 90% of the people are already immune, then you can see it's much less likely that you will uh, be in contact with someone who you might be able to infect. Right. Very helpful. So let's turn to the, so we've been talking about detection and, and measurement. Let's talk about treatment. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the convalescent plasma trials you're working on as a potential treatment strategy for COVID-19? Sure. So, you know, con convalescent plasma has been around for over 100 years, um, and it's really, um, it makes a lot of sense in the sense that what we're doing is we're leveraging the body's ability to fight infection. So, you know, the, the human body is an amazing uh, machine in the sense that when we're infected, uh, we can make antibodies. And the thing to remember is that we make many different types of antibodies to the pathogen or the, say, the virus or the bacteria. So imagine that my head was like a virus. You don't make just one antibody you might make an antibody to my nose, one to my left ear, my right ear, my mouth. And so the body has this amazing ability to create antibodies. And so we know that when people are uh, acutely infected, many of them do not make any antibodies for the first few weeks. So all that we're doing with convalescent plasma is taking plasma from people who've already recovered from the infection, who are now feeling well, and who have high antibody levels. So we take that plasma out in a blood collection facility, for example, in the blood bank um, at Stony Brook Hospital, um, under very, very safe uh, techniques that are used you know, uh, all throughout the world. And then we can store that frozen, and then we can thaw it, and we can administer it to patients who are actively infected who haven't had time to make antibodies yet with the hope that um, giving them these antibodies will be helpful. Um, so that's kind of the general concept and, behind and, it. And uh, so you're, you're currently uh, testing this, this approach in how many patients? Sure. So at Stony Brook, I believe we were the first uh, double-blind randomized clinical trial that was launched uh, in the United States. I believe there are now eight uh, uh, double-blind randomized trials in North America. Okay, so why don't you take a minute and explain what do you mean by double-blind double randomized? Sure. So um, we have evidence from some, some viruses in the past that convalescent plasma is effective. 
Um, however, we know it's not effective in all viruses. For example, there was an NIH-funded study um, that was published last year um, with influenza virus, so patients hospitalized with that, and it showed absolutely no benefit to convalescent plasma. So while we're incredibly hopeful that this will help our patients and save lives, you know, we recognize it, it may do nothing at all. Um, and obviously, it's a labor-intensive process, uh, consumes a lot of resources. So the only way to actually test whether something works is to do a double, uh, a randomized trial. So in our trial, 80% um, of the patients who are in the trial will receive convalescent plasma. And then there'll be a small group of 20% of people who receive standard plasma. And this is what's being done in many other trials around the world. And I just want to point out that because we hope this will save lives, we have a larger group of people getting the plasma, similar to what happens in many cancer trials. Typically, in a clinical trial, 50% or half the people get one thing and half the people get the other, whereas with this uh, trial, we wanted a, a large uh, percentage of people to benefit if there was a benefit. And, and you're randomly determining who's in which group. That's correct. So that's really the gold standard for clinical research is to uh, have a computer randomly allocate people. That way that at the end of uh, the trial when we've enrolled 500 uh, patients, um, we know that things called you know, measured and unmeasured confounders should be balanced between the two uh, groups, the people who got convalescent and the people who didn't. So if there's any difference in how well the patients do, we can attribute it to the, um, the convalescent plasma. And then the double blind part of it is where uh, the patients, the doctors, even you know people like myself, we do not know whether the people are receiving one thing or the other. The blood bank does, since they're actually issuing the blood product. Um, and that's really important so that we don't introduce any kind of biases in terms of how we're interpreting the data or uh, how we're collecting the data in these right. patients. Right. Well, I know, uh, I'm sure I speak for our entire audience. We hope that the, we hope the trials uh, you're leading are, are very successful, uh, ultimately. Um, Bettina Fries, let me, let me draw you back into the conversation. We're talking about antibodies. First of all, this issue about antibody testing, um, you know, this whole question about reliability and so forth, what would it take to improve them, or is there work going on to do just that? Uh, well, when it comes to antibody testing, I think one thing that people are concerned about is false positives and, uh, of course, also false negatives. Um, false positive, that means that um, somebody tells you you're antibody positive and then actually this is not correct. This is not the correct antibody. This was um, a false positive test. That can happen for two reasons. Some people tend to make a lot of non-specific antibodies that stick to everything. And um, that's not that common, but that can happen. And these patients can produce false positive antibody-based tests. Usually, they have very low levels, and as clinicians, we can sometimes tell this apart. Um, this is more common, actually, in pregnant women, but this can also happen uh, in other autoimmune diseases. The other um, reason why people could develop a false positive test is because they, in the past, have been infected with a coronavirus that is similar to um, is related to the coronavirus that we're dealing with now, and they could have memory of this um, coronavirus and have an antibody that can cross-react. And in that case, it's, um, it's a false positive test because it's an antibody that reacts a structure that is similar to the structure it was actually made to. But it's not COVID-19. But so it's it not be COVID-19 because um, there are about four viruses which are very which are related to COVID-19 that cause common colds, and many of us have seen these viruses in the past. So there is the potential that uh, we could have antibodies, pre-existing antibodies that cross-react. For the most part, though, if you have a good antibody test, an antibody test that really recognizes a part that is unique to the virus that you want to detect, that should not happen. And uh, if you have an antibody test that is um, that uses the spike protein, then that is probably less likely to happen than with antibody tests that use the um, NP proteins. Although a lot of antibody tests use um, are against the NP protein because um, they are 
more stable these proteins. So these are the these are different pieces of the virus. These different are different structures? pieces of the viruses, and some structures are more uh, common among all of the um, different coronaviruses, ah. and some are very specific. But if they're very common, then that would uh, that would increase the possibility of false of false results, as you just said. Yes, but. Overall, the possibility is very low because this has already been tested with most of these tests when they basically were presented to the FDA. But if you take a test and you, te and you use this test on 100 people, it's very different than when you start using a test on millions and millions of people. So even if you have a low false positive rate of, let's say, 1 in 10,000, if you start using this test in millions of people, then you're going to have a few cases. So what comes into play here is the prevalence of the disease that you're trying to detect. When you use these tests in a community where you expect a lot of people to have these antibodies, then you will still have a very good positive predictive value. But when you start using these tests in communities where nobody is supposed to have this disease, then the number of false positives is going to outweigh the number of real positives. Hmm. And that can cause confusion. Really interesting. Uh, we'll come back to this uh, in just a minute. Let me uh, welcome our audience back to the uh, Beyond the Expected podcast, Coming Back Safe and Strong, Pursuing a Cure. Uh, our guests today are Dr. Elliot Bennett Guerrero. He's the medical director for perioperative quality and patient safety for Stony Brook Medicine. He's also professor and vice chair for clinical research in the Department of Anesthesiology in the Renaissance School of Medicine at Stony Brook. Dr. Bettina Fries is chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Stony Brook Medicine. She's a nationally recognized physician scientist in the field of microbiology. She's a professor of medicine and of microbiology and immunology at the Renaissance School. And Dr. Richard Reeder is the vice president for research at Stony Brook University uh, and a professor of geosciences. Um, you know, this issue about the research that uh, is being done on testing, on uh, the clinical trials, it does bring up uh, an issue about funding. So, uh, Rich Reeder, let me reach back to you uh, just for a moment um, to talk a little bit about funding for all of this uh, pressing research. Um, I presume funding comes from a variety of sources, and maybe you could tell our audience uh, a little bit about that and about the challenges of securing adequate funding for this work. So, Michael... Early in the pandemic, we realized there was going to be a need for providing seed funds so that investigations, just like you've heard from, uh, can start. And so in collaboration with the Institute for Engineering Driven Medicine, which is part of the College of Engineering and Applied Science and the School of Medicine, uh, my office put together a seed grant program, and I'm very pleased to say that recently we just made 17 awards uh, for over $400,000 in seed funding. And this seed funding is very important. Each award is actually not that large, but it enables the researchers to put together the critical experiments they need, proof of principle, demonstration that they have a very good hypothesis and a way to solve the problem. And that then enables them to go for funding from another source, typically a, a federal funding agency like the National Institutes of Health or National Science Foundation. Uh, I'll also mention that SUNY uh, put together a seed grant program, and we had 14 faculty from Stony Brook win awards in addition to the ones that we provided. Then at the federal level, National Institutes of Health has really stepped up. They've provided additional funds as supplements to anybody who holds an NIH grant to pursue research related to COVID. And the National Science Foundation also put together a program they called RAPID, which was a sum that was used to start new projects and our faculty are utilizing all of these different funding sources. It's, it, it is remarkable. I know you've been, uh, you've been briefing uh, most of the university community on these matters, and the response to, the response to the COVID emergency by our investigators has been uh, amazing. They've, they've sort of pivoted, they've turned on a dime, as we like to say, and you know, reoriented themselves to, uh, to studying this, this disease. Um, 
Um, Elliot Bennett Guerrero, let me uh, let me circle back to you on this issue of of research and ask about uh, what are the what are the promising observations so far in your clinical trials to the extent you can sh share that with us. And uh, I'd like you to comment. I'll also ask uh, Dr. Fries to comment on, you know, what do you see as promising new treatments in light of what you're learning? But uh, Elliot, why don't you start? Sure. So I can talk about two big projects that Dr. Fries and I have been working on together. So one is our uh, healthcare worker study, where we wanted to understand what's the prevalence of uh, of uh, these antibodies to COVID in 500 healthcare workers. Uh, so we were able to, uh, about um, a month and a half ago, uh, do a quick uh, antibody test. It's basically using just a drop of blood that's obtained from the finger like you would if you were doing a blood sugar test in somebody with diabetes. And then it's a quick 15-minute test that actually provides what we call semi-quantitative results. So basically, we don't just determine if there is antibody, yes or no. We can also see if people have kind of low, medium, or high antibody levels. And the really interesting thing we saw was that the prevalence of antibodies to COVID was about the same as in the Long Island population. So at around that time, around hmm. 17%. And then the really interesting thing that we found was we asked the healthcare workers, how much time do you spend taking care of COVID patients? So some nurses or doctors said, I spend all my time with COVID patients. And some clinicians said, I really don't spend any time with COVID patients. And interestingly enough, we found absolutely no difference between the two um, groups of people in terms of their antibody levels. And so what that indicates is that the PPE, the hand hygiene, all these precautions are probably working incredibly well um, to protect healthcare workers from contracting. That's a, that's a very powerful finding indeed. And these 500 or so healthcare workers, they're all drawn from Suffolk County. Where did these people come from? Oh, these are uh, almost all within Stony Brook. Stony Brook. Uh, Stony uh -huh. Brook, yeah. So we have about 150 nurses, emergency room doctors, intensivists, respiratory therapists, so, uh, cr you know, across the, the whole range of, of healthcare practitioners. And, and it, it's interesting to hear you share these, uh, these data because I know, and we, in fact, on a previous podcast, we were talking with hospital leadership in the early stages of this crisis, the, the struggle to make sure that there were adequate supplies of PPE and other equipment to ensure the safety and welfare, not only of our patients, but obviously of our of our healthcare teams too. Sounds like it's been very successful. Well, we, we've been very, very uh, fortunate to have good PPE at Stony Brook. And so, and we're actually doing a, another test now a month later to see whether the prevalence of antibodies changes over time. And I, I also want to point out another thing, which I, you know, it's, it's more speculation on my part. I'm an intensive care unit doctor. And I think that for, for people who spend time with COVID patients in the hospital all the time, we see how desperately ill these patients are. I mean, it's really quite scary to see how uh, badly destroyed the lungs become in many of these patients. And I suspect that actually makes people a lot more likely to be uh, careful, not just within the hospital, but also outside the hospital. Outside. So, um, uh, Bettina Fries, maybe, uh, maybe you could uh, offer some observations about what you see as the most promising avenues, uh, and of course, your, your, uh, your cooperation with uh, uh, Dr. Bennett Guerrero on the study he just described. So, what are the, what are the trends you're seeing? So I think um, the trends that we're seeing is that we have to tackle this virus in three different ways. First, we have to really um, work very hard trying to identify medications that actually inhibit uh, the replication of this virus. And uh, we have made a lot of progress. Remdesivir, which is a medication that Gilead has now put on the market, is sort of the first success. This is an antiviral that is new and that has showed some benefit in clinical trials. And there are more clinical trials coming out now where people combine different antiviral medications. Some of these antivirals are old antivirals that we already know work sort of with other viruses. So that's a very important um, um, line of uh, clinical research. The other one is to work very hard on vaccines. The first vaccines uh, have now made it through phase one, so they are safe um, when they are injected into humans. Now we have to test whether they are efficacious, whether they work. And so we are hoping that by the beginning of next year, we're gonna start um, 
seeing um, some of these vaccines, um, hopefully they will be successful in inhibiting um, the virus. And so we're hoping that we will be able to use some of these vaccines, especially in healthcare providers and in um, people that are have very high risk of being exposed. And then the third line, um, which should not be underestimated, is really working out um, the social behavior that we have to change in order to mitigate the spread. And this has been very, very important to basically flatten the curve. And we know from the HIV epidemic that this was very, very important in the HIV pandemic that we really changed social behavior. And you see that every supermarket now has a plastic shield. Every bank has a plastic shield. We try to generate distance to decrease the chance. And these three approaches in combination, they are ultimately going to be the solution to this pandemic. So is it your perception that it's a very interesting point you've just made that uh, a lot of the changes in behavior, the social distancing, the reconfiguration of public spaces and so forth, that this is basically a permanent a permanent part of the of the landscape yes I think uh, especially in, in in certain in certain professions we have now learned that these people are extremely exposed you know people in the supermarket where hundreds of people walk by them and cough at them and so some of it just requires you know small changes but they have a huge uh, impact indeed um, so uh, let me also ask, uh, Rich, uh, you know, we're hearing from uh, Bettina Fries and from Elliot Benacarrero about uh, successes and uh, progress in uh, various investigative areas. What do you think is most critical right now uh, for maintaining the momentum at Stony Brook and in general, but you're our senior research officer, so we'll focus on Stony Brook, maintaining this momentum with respect to COVID-19 research? So I actually think that uh, Stony Brook has a tremendous opportunity right now. Y you've heard some of the research that's going on. We have world-class faculty. Uh, we have world-class doctors. We have uh, nationally recognized uh, hospital school of medicine uh, is excellent. We're right in the center of uh, a pandemic. Uh, we're a major research university on Long Island. I think there's a tremendous opportunity to develop synergies between fundamental research, clinical research, and the translational part of that to all pull it together. And that can really have a tremendous benefit, not just for the local region improving the health, but it has a national and an international impact associated with it. I think, as I said, there's an opportunity now. We need to support our researchers as best we can. We need to make sure they have the funding that they need to do this research. And we're working very hard to make sure the federal funding agencies know that, that all of our stakeholders know there's a need to continue that. And I'm very optimistic that Stony Brook is going to make a major impact in this area. You know, I, I, I'd also add uh, we've had enormous support from the community in terms of philanthropic support for the research enterprise, of course, but also for the operations in our hospital. We were just talking a moment ago about uh, assuring the adequate supply of PPE and other equipment for our healthcare providers. Community stepped up immediately when, uh, when this crisis hit home. Uh, to support our our first responders, so um, let's uh, let me let me draw uh, uh, Bettina Fries and uh, Elliot Benacarrero back into the conversation to talk about uh, the future. Uh, Dr. Fries was commenting about vaccine development over the course of the next uh, several months into uh, next calendar year. First, uh, uh, returning to testing again. Um, Dr. Fries was talking about changing social behavior and changing the nature of public spaces. Um, do you expect, do either or both of you expect that testing will become a feature, a permanent feature of the landscape as well, both testing for the virus or for antibodies, but also testing temperatures? Uh, I can, I guess, start with that. Um, so yes, we are um, 
initiating a lot of testing at Stony Brook to make uh, sure that uh, our healthcare workers and our patients are safe. For example, we're testing uh, patients before they come in for surgery to make sure that they're not carrying the virus. So that's a, a simple thing that really uh, everybody should be doing. Uh, I think that as more testing becomes available, we will see more testing of healthcare workers, uh, just because I think that's something that patients will demand. You know, if they're going to go to an institution, they're going to want to be confident that um, you know that it's as, as safe an environment as possible. Um, so I don't. That that's a very interesting point. You know, uh, I know that Stony Brook Medicine is beginning to take steps to renew so-called elective procedures in medicine and surgery, uh, and to bring uh, quote unquote routine patients uh, back for care uh, as uh, we start to flatten the curves in this pandemic. And uh, a big part of that effort is to. Uh, take the necessary steps and communicate about them uh, to reassure people that it is safe uh, to, you know, pursue elective procedures and engage in routine uh, and important health care itself. Um, Bettina Fries, would you, what's your sense of testing beyond the health care environment, in, in the workplace, uh, in uh, public spaces generally? Do you think this is going to be a permanent feature uh, for the future? I think that testing has um, a lot of um, power in terms of keeping us safe and, you know, especially in situations where we are dealing with a vulnerable um, population. So to give you an example, the nursing homes are now testing the healthcare providers twice a week because in a nursing home with um, a significant percentage of the patients being cognitively impaired, it's very difficult to implement social distancing. And to some extent, it's harmful to make elderly patients put them in such an isolated um, situation. So there we have to um, be very um, aggressive testing healthcare providers and testing elderly people to make sure that we identify everybody early if they become infected and then isolate those patients specifically. And that's been a mandate in um, New York and I think that makes a lot of sense. Now, in a similar fashion, we may, you know, eventually transition to um, testing people in situations where we want to have interaction, like in sports. You know, we can start testing all the sports team, and then we make sure that when the people play with each other, that they are for sure not infected, and that the ones that become infected because they're exposed somewhere in their communities or in their families, that we identify them early, and that we pull them out before they spread the disease through an entire um, team. Team. So there are lots of um, possibilities to use um, broad testing, um, always knowing that every test sort of has has its limitations. Um, the PCR tests are not 100% sensitive. Um, and knowing that sometimes a test can be positive and it doesn't mean that you're infectious. And also understanding that if you have positive antibodies, that doesn't mean that you don't have to wear a mask and that doesn't mean that you are invincible. It just means that you've had contact with a virus, that you have made an immune response. But at this point, we don't know how long that immune response is going to last. How long will it take to answer that particular question? I mean, I suppose that's part of the vaccine research that's that's currently underway. I mean, So in SARS, which was um, the coronavirus epidemic in China in 2003, and that's a virus that's very similar to this one, they um, they also documented that the patients made antibodies. They showed in follow-up um, um, investigations that these antibodies went away after half a year. Mm. But you still don't know whether there is long-lasting memory. So if these patients would have been re-exposed to that SARS virus, would they have made a protective immunity? We don't know that. But we do know from other viral diseases that even if your immunity doesn't completely protect you, usually patients that have pre-existing immunity have a milder course. And that's what we are hoping for. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. 
Um, so let me uh, let me ask both of you, uh, both of the uh, both of the physician scientists here with us. Um, what advice can you give to our listeners and viewers about the important things they should be doing to protect themselves, their families, their coworkers, their comrades? What are the things at the top of your respective lists in that regard? Uh, I think you know what I would stress uh, to uh, people is that one of the the really the really terrible things about this virus is that in contrast to the flu where you know most people feel terrible so then they know to kind of stay away from other people because so many people don't get sick or don't get that sick with uh, with this uh, COVID-19 I think what that's led to is a lot of people uh, being very complacent and feeling like oh this isn't a big deal and it's it's really not so bad and so you see people outside not wearing masks and 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 speaking you know just a foot from each other and 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 what I would just like to emphasize to people is that, yes, there are many people who don't get this that badly, but for the people who do get severe illness, and I, as an ICU doctor, and Dr. Fries and I see this every day, it is a horrible, horrible disease. Once you get this uh, in a very severe form, it destroys your lungs, and then the lungs take many, many weeks or months to recuperate, if at all. So I would say that, unfortunately, I think uh, we've really done a good job of flattening the curve. However, um, I think we're coming into what I'd call is the exhaustion phase of this uh, pandemic, where everybody kind of banded together for the first 10 weeks, and you know everybody's wow. done a great job working together. On the other hand, Probably the next couple of months is going to be the hardest with it getting warm and people wanting to get out and resume their normal activity. So I'd say just the need to still be vigilant is the most important Indeed, message. Indeed, quarantine fatigue. Right, yeah. right. Um, Dr. Fries. Yes, I would second that. I think the most important thing is to understand that it's spread people person to person. So the more people you're surrounded by, the higher your risk is. So you want to stay away from big crowds. You want to stay, keep a distance from people that speak loud, that cough, that um, you want to give up on shaking hands for now. And, um, and I think we should all not be fooled by the fact that the numbers, um, the numbers of um, people that died Sometimes people say, oh, it's not that bad. It's not that much more than for a regular flu epidemic. But people don't understand that for us to only have this number of dead people, we had to basically put to rest everything else in medicine and fully concentrate on fighting this pandemic. And so many people who didn't die st still got very, very sick. Every person that was admitted to the hospital needed oxygen, and they will all tell you that they felt horrible and that they were very sick. So we have to take this vir virus very serious. I think it's here to stay for now. And even th though the numbers are now going to go down, it's still hiding in corners, and we just have to be very vigilant and make sure that we sort of follow the guidelines and, and, uh, and continue to keep a distance uh, from people and wear masks wherever we can. So it's a very interesting point you've made. I'd just like to highlight it, that uh, for those who look at the data and talk in terms of percentage of population or resort to historical comparisons with previous pandemics or even a, a war episode, as is sometimes referenced in the press, I mean, those comparisons may have some sort of statistical meaning, but they overlook this opportunity cost issue you've just highlighted, that to, to keep the number of deaths, I mean, it's an enormous number in any absolute sense, but relatively speaking, to keep the number of deaths where they are, the allocation of resources has had to have been focused laser-like on this pandemic and nothing else. We know that many other patients are not being cared for on the regular basis that they would have been. We worry about that. Some people aren't seeking care when they should be because they're not COVID patients and so forth. So this is a really interesting point you've made that we're not really accounting for all of the costs when we simply look at some raw data like, like these. So now we have a few minutes left. I have a question for all three of you that I I basically ask all our guests on the podcast, and um, in light of uh, things that uh, all of you have said, and in particular that um, Elliot Benacarrero uh, referenced about quarantine fatigue, um, people are getting exhausted, right? We're all getting exhausted, both in the context of our work and 
obviously uh, people like yourselves who are literally on the front lines of the, the research being done to try and combat uh, the pandemic. But in any work in which we're involved, the pressures of this emergency have been intense. And then, of course, there are pressures um, in our personal lives. Our homes have been disrupted. Our relationships with our loved ones have been changed. And uh, so taking care of ourselves and dealing with quarantine fatigue, as I called it a moment ago, is is clearly an issue for all of this, for all of us. So I would ask all three of you, and we could, let's start with a Rich Reader. Is there any advice you would offer personally uh, to our listeners and viewers about, you know, to stay staying safe, but also staying, if you will, sane <laughs> in the weeks and months ahead. Any personal tips or experience you'd like to share? I think the context that I'd offer is, if you look at athletes in training, the successful ones keep their eyes on the long-term goal, whether it's an event, uh, a game or whatever it is that they're training for. They really stay focused. They try not to let other distractions come in. There are gonna be good days, bad days, but they have that long-term goal. I think that's one of the things that can help all of us if we have that long-term goal to get COVID behind us as best we can and come out healthy. That's what I'd offer. Great, great. Uh, uh, Dr. Fries? I would say count your blessings. I think we all have to realize that all the ones that didn't get sick were lucky. And uh, I think it's very important for the ones that had, um, you know, had disease in their family, maybe even have lost people, that it's very important to talk about it. There's going to be some form of a post-traumatic stress syndrome that we will start diagnosing because people in the pandemic, they didn't always realize how incredibly stressful that was. And that's also true for a lot of healthcare providers who have seen, have seen unbelievable misery. And uh, I think it's important to go outside, to take walks, to, you know, have some interaction with people, safe interaction, you know, where you, where you talk to people, you sit at a distance, you wear a face mask. But it's important for us to, to get back into a routine that we will all feel that we can sustain. And um, so it's important to pay attention to our own mental health and... Uh, and sort of hold on to each other and support each other. And uh, 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 Dr. Bennett Guerrero? I, I mean, I'd echo that and, and say, I, you know, people can do the easy things that we know are safe. You know, go out every day for a walk. We know if you're outside, you're much less likely to contract the virus just because of all the air, just as long as you maintain social distancing. Um, so, you know, you there's no reason with this pandemic you can't go for a walk every day. You can go for a walk with your family members. Uh, think of the things that you can take advantage of now. Maybe bring out that dusty guitar that you, you know, you wanted to be practicing and say, hey, I'm going to focus on uh, getting better with my guitar the next uh, month or two. So I, I always I would advise just try to focus on the positive things that you can do. Uh, wise words all. Um, Self-care is uh, very important uh, above and beyond staying safe in the context of this, of this pandemic. I want to thank our guests today, uh, Dr. Elliot Bennett Guerrero, Dr. Bettina Fries, and Dr. Richard Reeder. Uh, I want to thank you all for sharing with us uh, your knowledge and your expertise and your experience uh, as we hopefully begin to turn the corner uh, in this fight against COVID-19. Uh, the work all of you are doing is critical to that mission. Um, the advice and the guidance you've shared gives us, uh, I know I, I'm sure I speak for all our listeners and viewers, gives us reasons for optimism and hope, and also, importantly, some uh, real advice and guidance going forward. I'm Michael Bernstein. Uh, to all our viewers and listeners, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time on Beyond the Expected. <laughs>